and we wrote 20 of them in the subsequent year. And so that, that's the short answer to what led us to do the papers, is we saw this thing, gender studies as it was, we saw that its, opera, its followers were operating in kind of a weirdly zealous, almost puritanical religious context, mm -hmm. but for like this weird upside down, like hate-based sexism feminist thing. And so we decided to try to discredit the literature by doing all these fake papers. Then what led us to, or led me in particular, to take this on is literally all I do with my life now is when we were doing those fake papers, one of them was about education and it recommended that we abuse students in the classroom to teach them about mm. their privilege and to overcome their privilege. And we said, thinking it would be kind of hilarious, but also no way they're gonna take this. We said, well, we gotta do it compassionately. And the peer reviewers of this paper, and this is at a leading feminist philosophy journal, the leading feminist philosophy journal, uh, it's called Hypatia. The reviewers for this wrote back and said, we love this idea, but you can't do it with compassion because that recenters the needs of the privileged. Wow. And I remember looking at these words and it didn't strike me immediately. First I laughed and then I, it hit me what they mean and I had some conversations with a very small number of people involved that knew what was going on. We came very rapidly to the conclusion that this is the making, is that you, you're harming people, you're advocating for harming people and then because they have some special status of privilege, you don't take their harm into account. It doesn't count, and you can't center that harm because it would take uh, the view off of the so-called oppressed. And so that's what, if you want, radicalized me, to want to study this, to learn it, so that we can understand it and, and fight back and cure it. So what what was underneath the, the, the cry to harm? Because that sounds like incredibly ideological, right? Like they're they're really hell-bent on doing something, and they have an agenda and a playbook by which to, to do those things, it seems. Um, so, so I guess what, what I'm asking is, what, what, what did you find was behind like gender studies or behind this idea that you cannot speak sympathetically or compassionately about something, you have to attack that? When you started to dig into that a little bit further, what did you uncover? Yeah, I can tell you in a word, it's Marxism. Yeah. It is Marxism that's being recreated, not for the working class now, but for different identity politics, uh, so-called oppressed groups or protected classes. So critical race theory is race Marxism, which is why I wrote a book titled Race Marxism, The Truth About Critical Race Theory yeah. and Praxis. And then this gender studies is access to whatever, you have some kind of power dynamic, race and racism, sex and sexism, you know, misogyny, heteronormativity, whatever it happens to be, you have some power dynamic that they say exists in the world that's structurally created what that means is it comes from the relationship. This is Marx's theory. Marx said that, the, that, that there is the bourgeoisie capitalist and that there is the working class proletariat and that they are in class antagonism and their antagonism generates a structure of society. Mm -hmm. And everybody's positioned within that structure as either basically oppressor or oppressed and they're intrinsically in conflict with one another. And the oppressed are to be awakened and some of the oppressors are to be awakened so that they'll help facilitate so that there'll be a revolution and then the proletariat will take over and run a dictatorship until you get to communism. That's Marxism in a nutshell. Well, you have this exact same dynamic. Privilege means you have access to that upper crust, whatever it is. So for Marx, being privileged would mean you have access to capital or aristocratic private property, like you own an estate or something like that from the earlier stage of the world, or you own the factory or the machine. So you have, you're privileged because you have access to a special kind of property called capital. In critical race theory, you're privileged because you have access to a special kind of property called whiteness. Mm -hmm. And lest you think I make it up by saying whiteness is a special kind of property, a <laughs> key paper in critical race theory from 1993 by Cheryl Harris, a critical race theorist from kind of the founding generation, is titled Whiteness as Property. Yeah. And in that paper, she says that whiteness is the kind of bourgeois property that Karl Marx said needs to be abolished in the Communist Manifesto. And so whiteness is the, prop the special property you, if you have access to that, you have white privilege and you create an ideology called white supremacy that justifies why you get it and nobody else gets it. And you end up with a class antagonism that creates a structure of racism throughout society. You literally reproduce Marxism with race in place of class. And then within gender studies, it's the same thing. Do you have a, well, you can get with feminism on that aspect of it, it's male and female. But when you get to the gender stuff, is it, are you cisgender, are you transgender, are you binary, non-binary, whatever, or in other words, broadly speaking, are you normative or are you abnormal? 
and that creates if you have access to normalcy you are now in access to a special yeah. kind of property and you have privilege and dot, 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 the whole thing and you name it it doesn't matter which dimension of the weird stuff you're seeing in the world right now it's the same thing 